our next presenters are Professor uh, Tejri Okho, a faculty member in linguistics in the Department of English Studies at the University of Mauritius. And her research interests include multilingualism and language contact phenomena, as well as issues of language policy in multilingual communities such as Mauritius. Her core presenter is doctoral student Farzine Hassanbi, who is pursuing studies in journalism at the University of Derby. And uh, her interest happens to, to center around uh, race, colonialism, and post-colonialism in newspapers, language, and literature. Uh, their presentation is entitled Legacies of Slavery, a Diachronic Perspective to Derogatory Name Calling in Mauritius. Uh, colleagues, the floor is yours. Right, uh, hello everyone. So um, I hope you can see my, uh, my screen. And uh, yes, so I'm uh, Tejri Okul and my friend Farzine Hisambi and myself will be presenting on the legacies of slavery, a diachronic perspective to derogatory name calling in Mauritius. This is a brief outline of our study today. So without further ado, I'm going to move to the introduction for this presentation. So I'm going to start with this quotation from Benson, who says that names are not never simply our own. They are conferred to us and demand recognition from others to operate as names at all. As such, they are constituted within and are ratified by the symbolic order, the order of power and its inscriptions. And in the case of Mauritius, as we can see from this uh, image uh, on the right of the slide, very often names are meant to endure rather than to individuate. So in the case of uh, the cyclists on the right, Sarah and Sarah Jane Lapuyant, the name translates as literally as stinky. So Romain, who's looked at uh, the patronyms of the descendants of the enslaved in Mauritius says, good for nothing, stinky goat, read aloud in public in a hospital waiting room, these surnames, laughable for some or cruel for those who bear them. They participate in the social stigmatization of the descendants of slaves. And the above situation is one which is very common in societies built around empire and slavery, which have over time developed recognizable onomastic systems and repertoires intended to mark out citizens from subjects and enslaved. So as such, these names have become part of the process of what fields and fields have called racecraft or the conjurer's trick of transforming racism to race leaving the black persons in view while removing the white persons from the stage. So in the case of countries like Mauritius, there is this onomastic gap which exists and has existed and continues to exist between colonizers, former colonizers, the colonized and the descendants of those who were colonized. So studies have also regularly emphasized the attribution and use of names as visible markers of difference intended to generate a sense of injury. And in colonies such as Mauritius, onomastic violence took the form of derogatory names, which are still used as patronyms today. So we are going to use the above as a starting point. And our study aims to provide a diachronic perspective regarding the use of this injurious names. So firstly, it attempts to understand the ways in which these names embody the power dynamics existing between colonizer and colonized by focusing specifically on the period leading to the abolition of slavery in Mauritius. But it then seeks to connect their use to the broader phenomenon of derogatory name calling in Mauritius through an analysis of a selection of both colonial and contemporary news media. So our aim is to illustrate how the onomastic violence displayed during slavery has potentially led to the acceptance and moral grounding of derogatory name calling in modern Mauritius. So in the final instance, our aim is to connect these forms of verbal behavior to the maintenance of a cultural paradigm of social roles and relationships, which are characterized even today by profound power asymmetries. So quick historical perspectives to Mauritius. So Mauritius was discovered by the Portuguese. It was uninhabited. It was settled by the Dutch. It was then taken over by the French in the 18th century. They were the ones to bring slaves to Mauritius. Mauritius became a British colony in 1810. The slave owners remained French though. 
the British uh, voted for the abolition of the Slavery Act in 1833. Slavery would be formally abolished in Mauritius in 1835. But in 1834, a compensation commission would be set up in Mauritius so that slave owners who were facing the loss of their human assets would get a form of a compensation for those losses. So it is as part of this uh, process of seeking compensation that local slave owners had to register their slaves. And it is this process of slave registration which led to what Romain has called les noms de la honte, literally translated as the names of shame. So the slave registration form itself consisted of a table which required the first name and the surnames of the slaves to be provided. There were columns requiring additional information to be provided such as color, etc. These were not always filled in. So originally slaves had been attributed a first name by their masters, but for the purposes of registration, slave owners were required to provide a surname to their slaves, which their descendants would bear in the future and would not be able to change. So this is an example from the colonial slave registry from 1826. So these examples are of names which are relatively innocuous. So you have someone called Cloves or Pointy or Parsley. So we have uh, other sets of examples from the Colonial Slave Registry of 1817. So much earlier than when it was compulsory, but there was a step made to start registering the slaves. So we have names like the Sleepy, the Awakened, the Naughty, etc. And these names got progressively worse as registration became uh, compulsory. So for the purposes of this study, we are going to focus, first of all, on one of the first newspapers published post the liberalization of the press in Mauritius, namely Le Mauricien. At that point in time, it was published twice a week. It is published daily today. It is a French medium newspaper. So the first part of this study focuses specifically on the period preceding the formal abolition of slavery in Mauritius. 1833 to 1834. At that point in time, there was another newspaper, Le Cernier, which was the only other newspaper published in Mauritius, but it had been sanctioned by the British government because it kept opposing the measures implemented by the government at that point in time. So in early 1833, Le Mauricien was the only newspaper being regularly published. So I will now pass on to Farzine for the second part of the methodology. Thank you, Tejri. Uh, so for my part, I was looking at the con contemporary Mauritian context of name calling. For the second part of the study then, my sample consisted of a social media survey asking people um, whether they know people. So there was two instructions that they had to follow, whether they know people who had a real name and who also had a nickname, which was not the same or were not related. And the person's name must have some sort of meaning, whether it's a positive one or a negative one. This was then used for me to search the Mauritian newspaper for the period of 2015 and 2022 to see whether there was any name matching uh, in the newspaper, whether those names were actually being used on a public platform. So this was used um, and looking at newspaper because of the multicultural and multilinguist aspect of Mauritius to reflect that. So I had to look at different um, newspapers with different languages namely Le Mauritien, Defimedial, Express, Mauritius Time, I News, which use a range of languages, English, French, and Mauritian Creole as well. Um, as Mauritius has an issue with uh, archiving um, physical newspaper, we had to rely mainly on electronically archived newspapers. Right, so uh, our aim was to focus on the ways in which forms of onomastic violence are shown and rationalized by the media. So to do that, we focused on the discourses pertaining to the seven Ds of discrimination as described by Van Dyke. So we looked at discourses pertaining to dominance, differentiation, distance, diffusion, diversion, depersonalization, and daily discrimination. So uh, Van Dyke has said that these seven Ds of discrimination can be used in both racist discourse targeted at and about subordinate group members by those from the dominant group and they form part of what he calls casual everyday racism and they operate at all levels of language use. 
They are also broadly centered on the twin strategies of positive self-presentation and negative other presentation. So this is hopefully what we're going to, to try and show today. So first of all, we're going to look at the use of uh, the, the social and financial context of the derogatory names in the colonial newspapers. So this excerpt is from the 6th of November, 1833. Um, the, trans, uh, the original text is in French, the translation is provided below it. So as you, as you can all see, there is a contrast provided uh, between the word slave and man. So it's used to indicate the differential status and power uh, between the slave and the slave owners. It should also be remembered that the slave at that point in time also had a financial value attached to him. So uh, each slave uh, was worth around 31 pounds to uh, his uh, or her master. So that's uh, another part of the difference made between uh, slave and man. Men had no such financial value attached to them, whereas the slave did. There's also the use of the hypothetical construction, let us therefore transport ourselves, which is used to present abolition as a distant reality, something that the slave owners didn't really need to worry about just at that point in time. We also see from the same edition of the newspaper, the strategy of depersonalization. So there is the use of the words, these big kids, ces grands enfants là. So the contrast exists between the words, these big kids and men. We see the denial of the personhood of the slaves. And there's also the implicit assumption that it would take unspecified, unspecified years of tutoring to transform these big kids into proper men. So a week later, we see an article which is published from the perspective of the slave owners this time. And we see the strategy of diversion being utilized where attention is moved away from the issue of abolition through the use of pathos. So there is this focus on the loss of rights and the prerogatives of the slave owners. There is the lament this time over the fact that the masters are going to become the equals of slaves. And the pathos is so high that the irony of men having rights over other men is completely lost. The last line even presents the abolition of slavery as a sacrifice that the slave owners at that point in time were magnanimously assenting to. So what these excerpts from Le Mauricien uh, provide are insights into both the social and financial context of the abolition of slavery in Mauritius, Without any surprise, these excerpts perpetuate this discourse of racism and discrimination that existed in the society at that point in time. And what they support is this argument that naming could, in a sense, be equated to shaming. So in this case, the derogatory names were designed to act as a reminder of the so-called semi-civilized status of the slaves. And the aim was to ensure that even when the slaves were freed, they would never be able to aspire to the same status as their former uh, masters. And it would thus perpetuate the power differential that had always existed between them. So I'll now pass on to Farzeen for the next part of the analysis. Thank you. So moving on from this, so where do we stand now, nowadays, uh, in terms of name calling and shaming? So we have to go a little bit back looking at Romaine again. So Romaine categorized the name into five registers where the slaves were given name according to their physical attributes or some sort of behavior. The second point was of a sexual nature, which was mainly women. The third one was animal traits. Um, and the fourth one was plant-based names. And the fifth one was object, everyday objects that we can think of. Now, looking at name calling on the survey that I did, we kind of, got a pool of 100 names um, randomly selected. And it gave us that even today, the name calling still uses those qualifiers. So we can see 44 out of the sample of 100 was actually attributed to physical characteristics or some sort of behavior from ad admiration to repulsion. Now, what is interesting as well is all that this was used as a basis from, um, from slavery, we today have new categories merging, which is mainly food, location, profession, and celebrity. So those are names now that are, are being people are being called with, associated with those different registers that we found. But what is also interesting is the fact that later migrants to the country, which brought new languages as well, started to use that kind of name calling. So in our survey, we found names that were in Creole, 
So it has moved from French language to Creole names and now to also adding Bhojpuri words, which are from indentured laborers who came and brought the Bhojpuri language. So we've got names such as Pagla, which means mad in Bhojpuri, and Bagan, which are used, aubergine, to call people. Now, having this, we were looking at newspaper itself. So we wanted to see how deep it is in society. So we've got a Defi Media is a well-known, well-reputed newspaper in Mauritius that's read by everyone. And we've got a, an excerpt from a parliamentary debate that was taking up. Um, so the, the, the reporter gives us a snapshot of, the, of this episode. Now here we've got leaders, head of states using words which are associated with animals to insult each other. For example, here we've got Chiroke, which means a small um, rockweiler. La Kessat, which means um, the tail of a cat, Requin Blanc, White Shark, those are names that are used in Parliament by MPs to call out each other. And those stem from what we believe are from colonial times. For instance, we've got the physical attribute here, Mr. Sitanen, who's got a, who's got a particular type of hair, he gained the name La Kessat. It's a form of depersonalization that we've seen. So we can see the relationship between his physical, his, his physical characteristic and the name. The white skin, so here, what is interesting, the reversed of that racism that we see, the fact that Béranger, who is white skin, is called Requin Blanc, the emphasis here being on Blanc, meaning white. So we've got different, um, we've got different things as well. So the fact that he's a chiroke, the small dog that does that just barks. We're looking at the fact that behaviors as well are also used for name calling. The and this one is um, an extract from Lexpress reporting an incident between a citizen and the PM, the Prime Minister Mauritius. So the translation is provided here. So there's an L dot dot. So we assume this is a censored swear word. Uh, Pinocchio, tomorrow, no, tomorrow you will not be PM, etc. Now, Pinocchio is what people use as an everyday term to refer to the Prime Minister of Mauritius. And this has become part of and parcel of the colloquial language in everyday conversations. So we'll here see an example of depersonalization that's used at different level, whether it's at the top of society or at the lower level of society. However, what is interesting as well in this case is what readers had to say to so people who were we were looking at readers comment to this article now we've we went back to the l word again the censored word so we believe that it could have been the swear word which might stand for vagina pinocchio here giving him kind of a female characteristic okay to put him down or we were also looking at the fact that in previously in slaves there was always a determiner with the word so le or la to describe the person. So has this been replaced now with something else, a different type of qualifier? And this is something we were really interested in. Now, the next one is about the reader's comment. As I said, the reader's comment was really interesting here because we can see here what readers were saying. Should you really include the swear words? Although we know that the swear word was censored. Come on, Lexpress, there are kids who read this paper. Please have some respect. Uh, and then it's it's uh, commenting about very cheap journalism, poor journalism standards. So the readers here are not really concerned about Pinocchio being used in the article to represent the prime minister, the head of state in this case, but more concerned about the use of the censored swear words. That was really interesting to find. The next article is about a lady whose name is Miss Sornak. She is referred in this article as Vendée Cotomili, which also the article make reference to as being used on a daily basis by different people. Now, what is interesting is coriander seller. That's what Vendée Cotomili means. And the person's profession is being used in such a way to put her down. So she's perceived as being lower social class. So again, we see that kind of idea of dominance, the power that we talk about that Benson talked about earlier and that Tejri shared with us. Now, we need to understand where this name calling is coming from and how he got to this point. So in order to do that, we understand there are communities where injurious names have been used and they have potentially a positive role to play. For example, in Nigeria, calling your child frog is actually some way of 
um, death prevention names, as they call it, some way to protect that child. However, in the Mauritian context, it doesn't seem to have any positive connotation. And so far, the list that we also gathered through the survey didn't show that. So the next thing I'm going to show you is an advert from the posted by the Mauritius Football Association. Here, we've got example here of names and the ones in yellow are names who actually are descendants of slaves, we would say. Maison Rouge, Red House, La Bonté, the good one, La Ville, the city, Prosper, Patate, Potato. So the names highlighted show how common those noms de la honte, those names of shames are in Mauritian concept. But what is even more interesting is the fact that it, it affects only one part of the population, which is still fighting to get recognition. They are classed as a general population in Mauritius or the fourth community, although the slaves were there a long time before everybody, as Tejri mentioned, the country was inhabited in the first place. So they've gained the fourth community or the general population. Now to be noted in the constitution of Mauritius, um, communities actually based on religion, not skin color or ethnicity or race, which is interesting. They haven't been able to gain that level. So after the abolition of slavery, former slaves found it really hard to secure jobs and they still do. The first thing is that people look at their names and they're already written off because they, we know that they are descendant of slaves. Now, this is what Boswell has termed as le malaise creole or the creole malaise. She uses the term to refer to the historical events which have precluded the descendants of slaves from getting off the poverty treadmill. So making them victims for generations. Reicher compares a willful attribution of those names of a form of wounding based on hatred, in this case, the hatred of a black other, which still stand. It is still in society in Mauritius today, the black other that's still suffering from those names. So now let's look at the legacies of slavery name calling across time. So the original survey was conducted with intention of using the list for a keyword search across Mauritian newspaper just to see what names was around. The aim was to look at how the continuous use of derogatory names can potentially be weaponized in everyday interaction to endure and open it without, without uh, attracting public opprobrium. The nicknames being used in different contexts are not harmless, as we can see. Their aim is to endure. The newspaper showed that. The reader's comment published in Lexbus, as we showed earlier, did not take offense at the derogatory nickname but the censored uh, swear words. So that was the censored, uh, the censored swear word was found to be more offensive. So I'll leave Tishri to carry on this bit now. What we can assume is that the names being used have a different emotional force compared to the swear words. So we have researchers like uh, Devel who've said that there are taboo words used by multilinguals, which uh, will have more emotional force in one language whereas in another language, they do not have the same emotional force. So uh, it would seem that the names are another such pragmatic device and that in Mauritius speakers and addressees are fully aware of the pragmatic implications of selecting a derogatory nickname and that the emotional force of using a swear word appears to be higher than that of using a derogatory nickname. And what it shows in many ways, and this is our conclusion for today, so that the use of derogatory names has given rise to a social and cultural context which displays a degree of tolerance towards the use of derogatory names uh, uh, in the public domain. And as our analysis of articles from different time periods demonstrates, this act of giving derogatory names and of using name calling is shrouded in a discourse that was and is still quite discriminatory. So it still belongs to what Van Dyck has called the seven Ds of discrimination, and it's still part of a discourse that is one of the tools used in uh, racecraft and continues to perpetuate a culture of difference and dominance even today. So that's it from us today. Thank, uh, these are our references. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we're happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a thought provoking uh, presentation. Um, as we wait for questions in the chat, I do have a, a quick question for you. Um, well, actually a couple. So the you mentioned that um, the descendants aren't able to change their name, uh, their surnames. Ha has there been over time any um, political effort 
want of a better word, to try to reverse that particular um, law or policy? Not in contemporary times, no. Uh, people can change their names, uh, but it's a very long process. So you have to go through an affidavit at, at court. It has to go through the public newspapers, etc. There needs to be no public objection to you changing your name. So people can change their names, but it just doesn't happen. Um, in colonial times, from what I've read, there was an effort made by the British government to try and stop these practices. So they, they did provide a window for, uh, to the slave owners and told them to please change the names of your slaves, but uh, nothing happened, unfortunately. Okay, interesting. Uh, questions, anyone? Okay, Alexa, thank you so much. Alexa's question is, do you think that societal tolerance of name calling is increasing, decreasing, or static? Uh, should I answer this? Yeah, go yeah. ahead, you have the um, survey. So yeah, so I think we can see that name calling, I wouldn't say it's static or increasing or decreasing, but it has become more acceptable. People take it and, and take it for granted nowadays, so it's quite normal. And in the survey that I did myself, people were saying they didn't feel any remorse at that time. Maybe now, looking back, they said, okay, we should have thought about people's feeling when using those names. But now, you know, at that time, everybody was doing it and it's just normal for us to do it. And even today, people still do it because when I did the survey, people were laughing about it because I didn't actually say what was the point of the survey and what I was looking at. I just told them, do you know this? And then they gave us a list and going by this, there was people still laughing about like, you know, like calling their friend so and so, you know, which is quite, um, you know, it's not a very nice name, but, you know, it, they will joke about it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Eva's question is, have you looked at nicknames in Spanish as found in Mexican culture, like Flaco, as teasing, but not their actual name? Are there examples in Mauritius of name calling as a cultural phenomenon when it is harmless or fairly harmless? Um, I would say that there would be situations where people tease each other, but we but do not resort to name calling. What we see in the media and in the public domain, the names that we've presented, they are used with the explicit intention of attacking another person and of making that person lose face in the public domain. So I'm not sure whether there is a parallel between uh, Spanish nicknames or not. But certainly what we see in the Mauritian domain is that uh, when these derogatory names are used, their intention is uh, to attack and to generate that sense of injury. I would assume that any other nickname which is used in the personal domain would have a completely different intention, but that wasn't the, the, the point of this study. I don't know if Farzine would like to add yeah, something. Yeah, just adding on to what you said, I think it's about the power symmetry that we are talking about yeah. here in Mauritius. It is about power, that's what we found. It's about making us feeling better than the other person by putting them down through those names. So uh, obviously I'm not aware of the Mexican context, but yeah, so I don't know if that's different or similar. So we're, we're still living in a country where uh, spatially speaking, people live in different areas depending on uh, uh, where they came from. So there are still gated communities for some, non-gated communities for others. So the names are just reminders that uh, you belong to a community which is not gated, not protected, not privileged enough. And when they're used in the media, they act as reminders that whoever is getting that nickname attributed to them belongs to a, com to a particular group which is not privileged, not protected, and does not form part of a gated community, if I may put it that way. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for clarifying. Um, Ernesto shares with us that flaco actually means um, thin or thin man or thin boy. Uh, Cleveland made a comment about name calling uh, has increased from his perspective in the US in the last few decades, probably as a side effect of the use of social media, where people are more willing to express negative comments than they are in person. Uh, and he had a question regarding social media use as a factor in Mauritius. And then um, um, Alexa had a final comment about um, 
the uh, words uh, and names and so on. Like in, in El Salvador, people call each other like fatty or skinny or the black one, the white one and so on. And it's really innocuous. There's no, there's no, there's no malice. Clearly you have presented information that uh, is thought provoking. And I, I look forward to seeing uh, more of your work and, and, and perhaps reading more of it in the names journal. So thank you for presenting.